Is the Middle East worth fighting and dying for? In 1979, just a few years after the Vietnam War, America was forced to ask itself that very question because of three major and shocking events. First, the Shah of Iran was toppled in a revolution, so we lost our prime ally against the Soviet Union in the region. Second was the Iran hostage crisis. So not only Iran was no longer our ally against the Soviet Union, but it was now potentially our enemy. And third, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. So we asked ourselves, if Afghanistan today, which Middle East country would be next, Iran or other oil-producing Persian Gulf countries? My guest for this episode explains that before 1979, no Americans had died in military action in the Middle East. But after 1979, America's military strategy and military focus shifted from East Asia to the Middle East. This is a story of the militarization of America's foreign policy. It's a story of American wars and American military interventions in the region. And it's a story that we've been living with for more than 40 years now. Welcome to Unraveling the Middle East. I'm Adele Ali, your host. My guest for this conversation is Dr. Andrew Basevich, co-founder and chairman of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He's Professor Emeritus of International Relations and History at Boston University. He's a graduate of West Point, a Vietnam War veteran, and a retired colonel of the U.S. Army. He's the author, co-author, or editor of more than a dozen books, including America's War for the Greater Middle East and also The New American Militarism. So please join me and Dr. Basevich as we unravel the Middle East. Dr. Basevich, it's a pleasure to have you on our program. Thank you for taking the time for this conversation with me. When did America become militarily involved in the Middle East? Well, I'll focus on your reference to militarily involved. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. United States has been involved in the Middle East since the earliest days of the Republic. I suppose one could argue uh, even that Americans were involved even before the revolution. However, oh. mm -hmm. the military involvement uh, in, in my telling of the tale uh, began in 1979 with the promulgation of the Carter Doctrine. Now, uh, some of your listeners would say that can't possibly the, be the case. America didn't discover the Middle East in 1979. Yeah, uh, we had been involved there long before that. And in a sense, of course, that's true, uh, but not true in a in a in a military uh, uh, sense. Now, let me concede that during World War II, of course, U.S. troops fought in North Africa. Uh, U.S. forces used uh, Persia, modern-day Iran, mm -hmm. as a corridor uh, to extend uh, lend-lease supplies uh, to the Soviets. Uh, but that was a response to a very particular emergency. I guess more to the point, if we look at the period after World War II, as the United States engages in the Cold War, as the U.S. begins to create a uh, global empire, of, of military bases as the United States begins to embrace military interventionism in places like Korea, places like Vietnam, the Middle East remains an afterthought. Uh, oh, okay. There are no U.S. forces stationed in what we would call the Middle East uh, prior to 1979 with two minor exceptions that in a sense make the point. The one exception is that the so-called Fifth Fleet was stationed in the Persian Gulf, headquarters in Bahrain, but the Fifth Fleet basically consisted of three ships. It was not a significant fighting force. It was merely a presence. And the other exception that tends to uh, prove the rule is that in 1958, President Eisenhower directed the U.S. forces, a small number of U.S. forces, to intervene in Lebanon. Uh, but this was a, a, a bloodless intervention that lasted uh, a matter of, of, a, of a couple of weeks. So if we look at the entire period of American global primacy, 
mm -hmm. which I would date from World War II. Yeah. Uh, there are no U.S. forces permanently stationed in the region, except for the, the small Fifth Fleet, and there are no U.S. forces engaged in combat there. We've got oh. lots of Americans getting killed in places like Korea, in places like Vietnam. We don't have any Americans getting killed in, in the Middle East uh, until we get to the Carter Doctrine of 1979, promulgated by President Carter, which crucially, crucially designates the Persian Gulf region as a vital interest of the United States. And in Carter's words, a place that we would now be willing to fight and die for. That oh, wow. statement, the Carter Doctrine, is what initiates the militarization of U.S. policy in the region. It's after the problem, or I should say in response to the promulgation of the Carter Doctrine, that uh, we create uh, United States Central Command as a military command responsible for that region. It's, a, it's in response to the Carter Doctrine that the U.S. begins to prepare war plans to intervene in this region, begins to conduct exercises in places like Egypt to prepare for intervention, begins to negotiate over, over, over flight rights and, and uh, base access, uh, begins to pre-position equipment, uh, for example, in the Indian Ocean, putting in place all the things needed to intervene. Those had not existed until, until 1979. That's the reason I argued that it is with the Carter Doctrine that the U.S. military involvement down to the present moment, it's in 1979, that that narrative really begins. So um, let me ask a follow-up question and also clarify a point for myself and our audience. When we use the word military and, and you use the phrase military sense, we're excluding things such as coup d'etat, such as the 1953 coup d'etat in Iran, and we're excluding things such as providing military supplies and know-how to the regimes of the Middle East. Military sense, you mean boots on the ground in the Middle East, correct? Yes, I, I, I yeah. absolutely exclude covert operations. Yeah. Again, the, the argument here is not that the United States didn't care about the Middle East prior to 1979. The argument is that the Carter Doctrine in 1979 begins the process of militarizing U.S. policy, and the militarization of U.S. policy then leads to a host of other consequences, most importantly, a series of wars that continue down, down to the present moment. Um my follow-up question is this. You mentioned uh, World War II. Um, there was the Tehran conference where Stalin, Churchill, and President uh, Roosevelt actually went to Tehran. Um, did we replace the British Empire in the Middle East, essentially, after World War II? Well, I think, I think uh, the, the war uh, made the British Empire unsustainable. Mm -hmm. I think one could argue that that empire, uh, per se, formal empire, having colonies, you know, governing uh, people deemed to be of uh, of a lesser race. I think as, as by the time we get to the end of World War II, that entire proposition has been has been discredited, and therefore uh, the uh, the British Empire is is doomed. The Brits don't necessarily see that or acknowledge that. I think in retrospect. Uh, we can see it and, and acknowledge that. Yeah. So yeah. for so beginning with the immediate aftermath of World War II, a, a story of British withdrawal from the Middle East uh, uh, begins. Uh, and the era of British dominance in places like Egypt and Iran, uh, that is now coming to an end. Probably the event that most clearly illustrates that is the Suez Crisis of 1956. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you'll recall undertaken as a result of a conspiracy involving Great Britain, France, and Israel with an immediate aim of overthrowing President Nasser in, in Egypt and reclaiming uh, uh, for France and Great Britain ownership of the, of the Suez Canal. Yeah. Uh, Nasser having, uh, having uh, nationalized the canal, that was the uh, the, the trigger uh, for the military action. So this effort on the part of Great Britain to assert 
great power uh, authority uh, to demonstrate that the old empire in this region was still sustainable ends up be failing catastrophically. Yeah. Uh, and I think more than any other particular moment, that's what signals that Great Britain is, is doomed uh, as an imperial power in the region. And, and there's going to be a power vacuum. It doesn't follow inevitably that the United States is going to fill that vacuum. But I think when you consider the broader context of the Cold War, pitting the United States against the Soviets, the West against the East, uh, that outcome probably was pretty close to uh, foreordained. You mentioned uh, the withdrawal uh, of Britain after World War II from the Middle East, um, which makes me think of uh, this question. Today, we think of Israel as strategically important for our country. Was this always the case, Dr. Basevich? No. No? Uh, I mean, it's it is certainly true uh, that uh, President Truman, in 1948, when the, Israel declared its independence, uh, that, that President Truman, uh, along with the Soviets, uh, hastened to recognize uh, Israel as a, as a legitimate nation state with a place mm -hmm. in the international order. And the United States has never retreated from that rethought that. However, it doesn't follow that we sought to have some warm uh, uh, friendship uh, with Israel, a special, we didn't seek a special relationship. We certainly didn't speak, uh, try to forge a military relationship with Israel. All that would follow uh, in the subsequent decades. So for example, we, we take it for granted, I think as Americans, we take it for granted that the United States provides something on the order of three or three and a half billion dollars of, of weaponry yeah, uh, yeah. every year. No strings attached. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Just happens. Uh, bipartisan support. Uh, nobody, nope. <laughs> it's just, it just happens. Yeah. Uh, well, that was not the case in the 1950s. The first significant huh. uh, uh, supply of weaponry uh, by the United States to Israel didn't happen until the Kennedy administration in the early 1960s. Uh, and, and significantly, I think, uh, it was a weapon sales. Uh, the United States agreed to sell to Israel uh, Hawk missiles, which were then uh, a type of anti-aircraft missile. But it, they didn't give them to them. <laughs> they said, you got to pay for these things. Oh, that's kind of uh, like but, when we that, sell stuff. What, Go ahead. Go ahead. That, you mean sale as in we were not given them? That's different than what we do now, right? Bingo. Absolutely different. Oh. In other words, right today, that that three, whatever it is, 0.5 billion dollars of of uh, what Washington calls security assistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that that's paid. That's that's American taxpayer money. Uh, in the sale of Hawk missiles by the Kennedy administration, it was Israeli money to pay the United States uh, um, for those missiles. I know this next question could be a whole podcast on its own. I'm just wondering, when did that change happen from selling to them versus assisting and giving it to them for free? It, hap it happens incrementally over time. Uh -huh. uh, I think a very significant milestone in that is going to be, uh, was uh, the Six Day War of 1967. Uh, oh, yeah, the Six yeah. Day War uh, has, I think, been radically misinterpreted from all from several points of view but it seemed at the time that the very survival of israel was at risk and i think that that served in a sense as a wake-up call uh, which substantially changed u.s attitudes with regard to the security of of israel so beginning with 1967 and then increasing over time, uh, the, uh, the, the, the terms of the relationship change so that the United States ends up providing uh, what, it, what it does today. Oh, uh, I see. No, at no cost to the government of Israel. We'll be back after a short break to talk about America's military involvement in the Middle East in the last decades of the Cold War. We'll be right back. Well, it's one of those times in history that, um, you know, when you have a very strong hand, you think, why settle now? Which is also the moment that the other side 
feels most compelled to settle. So, so the United States showed Iran that it's willing to go to war. So it actually got its hands dirty in Iran. Yeah, so yeah. at that moment, uh, they, they are really, really motivated in basically backing the U.S. off. And Khatami says, okay, here's the solution. We offer them broad-based talks that include everything from, at that point, at that point, there was no m- nuclear issue, really. Mm-hmm. So what, let's talk about Hezbollah, terrorism, path to normalization, etc. But the United States had just toppled a government in two weeks. This is the moment of hubris in the Bush administration that he thinks not only is militarily absolutely mighty, but, I, but that it's going to change the entire Middle East by removing dictatorship. So it's a mentality. And I think some people like Dick Cheney and Wolfowitz and others were saying it, that today Baghdad, tomorrow Tehran. It was this rhetoric that we're going to liberate Najaf, which is the holy city for Shias in Iraq. Is that something they were literally saying? Oh, yes, discussing? they were. That, okay. I mean, well, they were not necessarily saying it on, on news conferences, but this got reflected in a lot of media, which was basically parroting what they were hearing from administration officials. Uh, or, or there were people like Michael Rubin, et cetera, who were very close to the administration, were talking and writing about how Najaf is going to bring about a sort of a liberal Shiism that will undo Iran. I mean, there was, there, was a, there was a thinking that, you know, we went into Iraq, but the real target is Iran. And once Iran falls, Islamic fundamentalism is over. I mean, in theory, it sounds right. You know, yeah. that's where Islamic fundamentalism became the power that it is in 1979. So they reject the offer. I mean, it's a, it's a moment where, where you're winning and you say, why stop? Dr. Basevich, in the last segment, you mentioned the Vietnam War. And as I understand it, you served in the Vietnam War as well. How did our military involvement in Vietnam change our military policy in the Middle East? Well, uh, it, indirectly, uh, indirectly, but ultimately, uh, significantly. The larger context here is the Cold War. I mean, why, why did we fight this foolish war in, in Vietnam? Vietnam? Yeah. Well, the answer is because it appeared that uh, the essence of the of the argument was the free world pitted, pitted against global communism. Uh, that 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 was being uh, that Vietnam was one of the places where this great historic confrontation was going to be decided. We were going to draw all the that, line there, right? All that turns out to be malarkey. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in, in retrospect, what what why we? It's all malarkey, nonetheless. Okay. Uh, given the mindset of, of the time. Uh, the, the South Vietnam is deemed a place worth worth fighting and dying for. Yeah. Uh, and when that war goes badly, uh, badly would be a understatement. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it 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 leaves the U.S. U.S. forces uh, badly demoralized. Uh, in in terrible shape, uh, and it finds the American people, I think, uh, uh, disillusioned, made, yeah, disillusioned, yeah, uh, and and the what we would call the establishment uh, comes out of Vietnam, facing a challenge of how to reconstruct the armed forces. Restore morale, restore effectiveness, and also restore uh, among the American people a sense of confidence uh, that the U.S. armed forces are are competent. It's very hard for us to remember now that by the time back in 1969 or 1970, uh, the U.S. Army, in in the eyes of of many, perhaps most Americans, uh, looked looked like the gang that couldn't shoot straight. Uh, everything we did. But we won uh, World War II. I mean, that's within living memory of people in 1969. And, and that was what was supposed to happen in Vietnam, and it sure yeah. the heck didn't. So so there is a strong need after Vietnam to try to rebuild the American military, not simply in a substantive sense, but but restore confidence in the American, mil- in the American military in the eyes of the American people. Uh, so so, there was, so there... the military, the military comes home from Vietnam, 
and a, and a big question that it faces, that the national security type of it faces. Well, if, if, if we're not gonna fight in places like Vietnam, where should we be prepared to fight? What kind of forces should we, should our, our, our should the American uh, Army, Navy, Air Force be, be gearing up for? And the answer they came up with is, well, obviously we should prepare ourselves to fight the Soviets. Of Get course. ready to fight the Red Army. Yeah. The, not, the, not the North Vietnamese Army. Not the proxies, the Red Army itself. Exactly right. So the United oh. States in the 1970s embarks upon a, a major reform project to try to restore effectiveness and self-confidence in the American in the American military, with an eye toward the possibility of war uh, in with, with the Soviet Union. So we're doing this in the 1970s with an eye towards USSR, right. USSR, um, and one of our biggest allies in the Middle East is the Shah of Iran, Imperial Iran. Bingo, and. I want to go back to what you said before, the Carter Doctrine, 1979. Uh, you know, Middle East is is, is a region right. worth fighting and dying for. Right. And all of a sudden, you have the Iranian Revolution, 1979. The Ayatollahs, all of them come back. What happens here? First of all, what's the Carter Doctrine? And then, okay, so the Carter Doctrine is a statement uh, in a speech by Jimmy Carter, I believe, January 1980. Okay. So after the Congress, revolution of Iraq. After, in, in, in many respects, in response to the revolution. Oh, We okay. had been counting on the Shah to be a stabilizing force in the region. When he is overthrown and replaced by anti-American radicals, then expectations that we're going to get any help from Iran disappear. Of in course, many respects, yeah. now the expectation is Iran has become a problem. Almost simultaneously, in December of 1979, the Soviets invade Afghanistan. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. what's going on here? Uh, and the, the interpretation is that with the United States weakened by Vietnam, the Soviets have now embarked upon an effort to expand their empire, expand it by seizing control of Afghanistan, and then, this is the perception at the time by the Americans, continuing into Iran, arguably towards Saudi Arabia. Why? Why? Why would the Soviets do that? Because of oil. Because by the time we get to the end of the 1970s, everybody understands the strategic importance of oil. The perception is that there is a finite amount of oil that world supplies are dwindling and that the prosperity of the United States is dependent upon American access to oil, a point driven home by the oil crises of the 1970s. Yeah, 1973. It suddenly, it suddenly appears that American prosperity, even American democracy, is dependent upon access to Middle Eastern oil. And Jimmy Carter responds to that by saying, and therefore, I declare, that we will fight for the Persian Gulf. Oh, wow. That's now, a big statement. That could have. OK, you, you I, think I, 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 I want to I want to make sure I understand this phrase that you used, this, this statement that you made. We were counting on the show. When you say counting, I mean, how big of a military force was Iran? We, well, we were supplying uh, we were we were arming the Iran, uh, arming Iran. I don't I don't know the numbers. It was a okay. billion, two billion dollars worth of weaponry per year. That's substantial. We were training Iranian forces it was an expectation that Iran, in a sense, would uh, uh, that we could outsource uh, Persian Gulf stability to Iran. We were counting yeah. on him to be our our policeman on the beat. And of course, when the revolution overturns the, the Shah's regime, that expectation is demolished. Well, who's going to who's going to police the beat? Who's going to maintain stability? Who's going to ensure that the war continues to flow? And the answer that the Carter administration came up with, that's going to have to be us. You know, as you explain this, Dr. Basevich, uh, the way that I see the Carter doctrine, it almost sounds more 
existential type of worry about yes. than, let's say, Vietnam. Vietnam was a policy of containing uh, the Soviets and and fighting the Cold War. But in our eyes, had the Middle East been lost, that may have undermined our country. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I agree with you because, oh. uh, however foolishly, foolishly, mm -hmm. uh, we had persuaded ourselves that freedom itself was at stake in Southeast Asia, that that it was a vital oh. interest of the United States to ensure the safety and security of the Republic of Vietnam. Again, in retrospect, nonsense. nonsense. Didn't appear that way in 1965 when President Johnson begins to uh, Americanize the war. I would argue that the perception of the stakes uh, in the Persian Gulf, in the Middle East, uh, after the overthrow of the Shah and after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan is comparable. It does appear in the eyes of American policymakers, in the eyes of many Americans who, who were very disturbed by these long gas lines. It, wow. it appeared that the American way of life, our freedom was now at stake. And it was wow. that perception then that leads the Carter administration and all succeeding administrations to uh, to militarize U.S. policy, uh, to, um, to begin to gear up to intervene in the region in ways that the U.S. military had never prepare, prepared for before. Let me share a personal story with you. Um, I was a I was a kid. It was my cousin's birthday, and the mother of one of the guests rushes in. Uh, we were living in Tehran, Iran, and she says, yells out, the airport just got bombed. Iraq invaded Iran. Did we know this? Did we help Iraq? Um, there are some stories that we gave the green light to Saddam Hussein, but that's been rebutted. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I don't have any thoughts on uh, the specifics of how the conflict began. I don't know. I mean, clearly it was begun by Iraq, by Saddam Hussein, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, whose, whose purpose was uh, to seize uh, certain oil fields uh, that were disputed, had long been disputed, I think, between Iran and Iraq. So he, uh, S Saddam looks across the border, he sees the turmoil of the revolution in Iran. And so he says, hey man, this is going to be easy. Let me take I'm advantage gonna, of I'm this. Gonna send, I'm going I'm to go grab this low hanging fruit. Uh, and so he initiates the war. Uh, the, the sad part, I think, is that uh, the United States then chooses to take sides. I, I bet you it's not one American out of 100 uh, actually knows this. <clears throat> but the United States supported Iraq in the Iran-Iraq war of the 1980s. It did so by providing intelligence. It did so by providing material wherewithal. It did so by facilitating the sale of weapons to the Iraqi military. We didn't provide any fighter aircraft or tanks, uh, uh, but we provided all kinds of other material <clears throat> support in this horrible war that went on the entire decade. Why do you say the sad thing? Wasn't Iran uh, suddenly an anti-American government? W doesn't that come the, natural the, to us the, to help? The, the, to me, the sad, the sad thing is, I don't remember the number of Iranians and Iraqis who oh, were killed in this war. I think war. it was over a million, yeah. Something like that. Uh, yeah. And it solved nothing. Uh, yeah. And the United States was complicit. Uh, yeah. Complicit in supporting Saddam Hussein, who of course, a decade later, we portrayed as the, the embodiment of evil. I mean, it's, yeah. it's kind of, you can't make it up. <laughs> you can't uh, make it up. Um, I, I want to, um, in the in the minute we have left of this segment, Dr. Basevich, I want to make sure I understand a phrase that you've used, a, a, a term to use several times, establishment. What do you mean by that? Well, it, I, I, it's probably a, a, a term that I, I, I shouldn't use. Uh, but I, I do believe that uh, uh, since World War II, mm -hmm over time in and around washington a national security apparatus has come into existence uh, what does it consist of well it consists of the military it consists of the civilians who provide oversight to the military the national security council mm -hmm. uh, intelligence agencies uh, who share a common mindset 
and and the mindset is one centered i think on two things number one the united states has to exercise unquestioned global leadership and number two the exercise of global leadership requires military superiority if not military supremacy uh, oh. and, and 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 vietnam certainly uh, uh called all of that into question uh but and and the overthrow of the shah the soviet invasion of afghanistan all of that seemed to suggest that american global leadership was weak and that the american military needed to uh to, to restore itself to put vietnam in the rearview mirror to once again possess unquestioned uh superiority unquestioned and, superiority and, and 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 the middle east was the venue uh was one of the venues maybe the most important venue when that had to be sorted out in the eyes of the establishment the establishment i see let's take a break here in the next segment of our conversation we'll talk about america's military in the middle east after the cold war some of which we already talked about and after 9 11. and i'll ask dr basevich this question on the whole has our military involvement in the middle east paid off <laughs> 